is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. Hop off the puzzle. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Jay from Sub70. It is March 16th. The second round of the Arnold Palmer Invitational is about three quarters of the way over. Uh, the current leaders are Henrik Stenson and Bryson DeChambeau. Uh, a couple other notable guys up on the leaderboard. You got Patrick Reed, uh, Ricky Fowler, Rory McIlroy is currently six back, but he's gotten his putter going the last couple of days, which is good to see. Tiger Woods is at three under, pretty lackluster second round so far. Hasn't really hit anything close, hasn't putted all that great. Uh, just kind of a ho-hum round. But uh, he's getting back in contention and definitely making cuts, which is always a good thing. This episode of our podcast is an interview with Mark Immelman. Mark is probably one of the best all-around golf conversations you could have. Uh, he was a three-time All-American in college. He played professional golf. He's the director of golf at Columbus State University. He has taught. He has his own podcast called On The Mark, which is through PGATour.com. He's a just all-around golf guru. I mean, he just has been in the game for a long time. His brother is Trevor Immelman, who won the Masters and was a great golfer. So he's got tons of experience, tons of knowledge, and is really an interesting conversation. Jason and, and Mark talked a lot about growing up in South Africa, uh, how he got into teaching, talked a lot about other South African golfers, and also just talked about current guys on the tour and what he sees. And um, also just give some tips on getting ready for golf season starting for those of us that are kind of trapped in the winter for four or five months a year. So it's a really great interview. Um, check out Mark's podcast. Like I said, it's called On The Mark. And Mark's Twitter account is Mark underscore Immelman. You hear him on PJ Tour Live and other broadcasts all the time. Uh, thanks to Mark. And here's the interview. Well, I would like to welcome to the podcast a three-time All-American at Columbus State, former touring professional, noted instructor and on-course reporter for the PGA Tour, Mark Edelman. Mark, thank you very much for joining the Sub-70 podcast. That's my pleasure, Jason. It's good to be with you guys. I know you're out at the Valspar today, and uh, if our recording goes out a few days later, it's the first round, uh, the Thursday round. Uh, Who would you get to follow and kind of uh, get a good look at, and what was sort of your impressions of the day? Well, we had a fun day in the morning. We had the McElroy feature group, and that was lots of fun, Rory and company. And then for a little while, we were on Tiger and Jordan Spieth and Henrik Stenson, you know, doing the featured groups for PGA Tour Live makes it lots of fun because you get to follow these guys for basically their entire round and to watch you know the challenges the struggles to see guys like McElroy Justin Rosen coming in the morning dealing with some really cold blustery conditions was was you know fun as a spectator it wasn't fun for the players certainly because the golf course uh, the, the Copperhead course at Innsbruck is hard on a good day and you add blustery winds out of the northwest that were chilly it becomes all the more daunting because the course got firm and fast and it was really hard to make birdies, honestly. And then the afternoon wave came through and it was a little warmer so the guys could swing a bit more freely. And And, and Tiger played pretty solidly, was even par for a while while we had him in our broadcast window. And Jordan Spieth, surprisingly, was the guy who sort of battled. I mean, he was struggling along, not having quality shots and missing putts. And Henrik Stenson, a former winner of the Valspar Championship, he also struggled some the time we had him in our broadcast window, he was birdie free. So it was a tough day, but it was a fun day, really. And uh, I tell you what, that Valspar Championship is an awesome spectacle this year. They've got such a good field with Spieth and Tiger and McElroy and Stenson and Rose and, and company. And, and Valspar is a tremendous sponsor. But for me, I think the golf course was the story. I mean, it's a tremendous golf course designed back in 1972. When you're on the premises... It doesn't feel like you're in central Florida because the the, the fairways are tree-lined hardwoods and, and, and like scrub pines and 
Now, there's a lot of elevation change, so it's a really good spot and a heck of a golf course. I saw Rory struggled a little bit as well. Um, from your observation, what do you think is kind of going on with his game? Uh, it seems a little inconsistent at times. Uh, what are you sort of seeing from an instruction or from an instructor standpoint of what you're seeing out of McElroy right now? Well, from an instructor's standpoint, I would almost call it the intangibles, you know, the things that you can't measure. Um, looking at statistics, he's not striking his irons as well as he ordinarily does. Uh, the putting is okay. The driving is still, you know, Rory McIlroy style, which is like a Rolls Royce. But for me, it's the intangible because it almost appears like he's trying to force the issue some. So, you know, situations where maybe holes are cut in places that wouldn't warrant someone attacking, you know, you're trying to force the issue because you're in a bit of a slump. So then as a result, you maybe attack a flag that shouldn't be attacked and then the ball bounces through the surface and you get yourself maybe short-sighted or something to that effect. And so for me, that's the main thing with McElroy. And now it's easy to say, it's easy to say to a person, well, you know, remain patient and hit balls and, and, and hit shots on their merits. But, you know, especially someone like a Rory McElroy, who's a real virtuoso, you know, he knows what he's like when he's at his very best. And then when you're not at your best, you, you still feel like you should be able to do it. So it becomes frustrating. So I would say for McElroy, the golf swings there, you know, the ball striking, is hit, it's hit on the button. They're not miss hit or anything. I would just say, you know, select a few smarter targets and just sort of accumulate rounds. Whereas in the past, you know, we all know when he's on, he can basically take a golf course by the scruff of the neck. So I'm saying just be patient. Just let the round come to you. And I'm sure very, very soon, McElroy will be at top leaderboards again. Yeah, it'd be good to see him up at the Masters. It'd be a great story for golf if, you know, he's going for the, the final leg of the Grand Slam. I, he always seems like he's very, very close to being, you know, a top two or three golfer in the world consistently. The talent is immense. So I hope he gets it straightened out for the Masters where he's contending. It'd be a wonderful story for the game. So we'll see. Well, he was actually up there. Sorry, he was actually up there a little bit last week, and he was playing a practice round with Jeff Knox. And that's like a tradition for them because they check out greens and Jeff Knox, the member there, um, knows the greens very well. So he guides Rory around the place. And, and McElroy has spoken openly this week about, you know, sort of focusing towards the Masters. Now, each event like the Valspar Championship and the Arnold Palmer Invitational and the match play and these things, they're big deals. And the players sort of direct their focus towards those events. But there's no doubt for McElroy that his mind is in the first week in April. Yeah, it would make sense. What a great guy to play with. Like it's always so interesting to watch Jeff Knox when he's the marker. He 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 damn near beats <laughs> half the people he plays with. He's such a great stick. So can't have anybody better than really to show you Augusta than Jeff Knox, I can't imagine. Absolutely. Um the other topic I was gonna bring up is podcasts. Um I've really enjoyed the podcasts. I listened to your podcasts with on the mark that you're doing for uh, on the PGA Tour, uh, for PGA Tour dot com. How have you enjoyed being the host, and also how do you like being on the other end when you're getting interviewed by somebody on a podcast? <laughs> well, you're reversing the roles on me, which is lots of fun. Um, normally, I'm the guy asking all of the questions, which is a lot of fun for me because um, when I was a full-time instructor, I had sort of designs on being one of the leading teachers in the world, and I worked with a few good players and helped them to some major championship success. But being on my end of things now, where you get to basically seek out the best and the brightest and, the, and the, the leaders in their field in terms of instruction or physical fitness or, or, or mind gurus or whatever the case might be, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And I've always adopted a real holistic sort of an approach to instruction because I believe that the human being is, is the common denominator. And when the human being's mind and body and spirit and soul and that are all jiving, you know, the form will, will tick upward. And so it's neat, neat to be able to bring that perspective to a global audience. And then it's neat to be able to, you know, bring the great minds in, in, in instruction and in golf to the global audience too, because for a lot of folks, they may not have access to PGA to a live or to the golf channel or to the golf digest or whatever it might be. So, bringing these instructors, bringing these players and stuff to to the fans and to the listeners to the On The Mark podcast for me has been really special and it's an honor that I don't take lightly. Who's been one or two of your favorite guests that you've had on? Well, well, I know your brother has been on. It was really interesting to have Trevor on there, but let's, let's set he him aside. He was my favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's your favorite. But other than your brother, um, 
Who uh, who else did you really enjoy talking to? And was there an interesting fact you learned about that person from asking questions that you didn't know about them that kind of maybe surprised you? Well, I've had a few for different reasons. The ones that stand out, I would certainly say the podcast with Davis Love was so much fun because as a young instructor, I always hold his father, Davis Love Jr., in such a high regard. And so to get Davis to share anecdotes from you know, when he was a young man learning the game from his father, just learning the approach that they took on. And his dad, you know, was about instruction, but there was a lot of self-discovery on the go for young Davis. And they'd play like chipping games and stuff, and he'd make Davis hit balls under stuff and over stuff. And and some of the ideas that he shared were just so simple and so easy to comprehend and grasp. That was all sorts of fun. Uh, but, you know, all the Hall of Famers, Nick Price was, he spoke us through, um, his final round at Turnbury en route to his Open Championship title and how he shared that in his warm-up, he really didn't strike the ball very well. And then through the through the first nine, maybe ten holes or so, he played as such. So he didn't make very aggressive decisions and he played sort of defensively and hung around. And then all of a sudden on the back nine, he was in contention and then decided he had to start playing a bit more aggressively, which he did. And so that turned into the victory. So... It's fascinating to hear those sorts of anecdotes, you know, things that you wouldn't ordinarily know that as a player, final round, kind of battling with the game. So he made smart decisions and and sharing things like that with the listeners, I think, is sort of eye opening and sort of enlightening because most golfers think that these Hall of Famers and these tournament winners, they've got the thing on on, on cruise control the entire time. So those are fun. But, you know, some of the great instructors, I've, I've had a great time talking with. Martin Hall, he was a tremendous interview. David Ledbetter, you know, we've had basically the bulk of them. So, so picking a, a one would be hard. I would say all of them were just very interesting in their own right. And and as a golf fan and a, a golf nerd like I am, you know, I go and listen back to some of these. And every time I listen, there's a little new thing that I put in my notebook. So, it, it's been all sorts of fun. And picking one is really really hard. If you could have or is, let me rephrase it. Is there a guest you have not had on the podcast yet that you would just love to have, assuming they would be honest and answer the questions? Is there is there just one that you're just, I would kill to have that person on for 45 minutes and talk? Well, yeah, definitely. I've, I've had Gary Player on, which was great. Um, obviously, would love to get Jack Nicholas on. Um, it goes without saying that you'd like to get into Tiger Woods' head a little bit. Um, but that's where... I've been so fortunate with a lot of the players we've had on. Like Kevin Na that I had recently was very insightful, and so was Brendan Steele. So you never know what these players are bringing. But I would say Jack, definitely. Phil Mickelson, absolutely. Tiger Woods. And then, you know, I'd love to uh, I'd love to get into the head of, of Jordan Spieth and Rory McIlroy. I think that both of them, they play different games, and they're true to themselves, which for me is the first thing that any golfer must try and do. And so just getting their take on how they play the game is cool. And, you know, it sort of reminds me of a podcast I did with Sergio Garcia uh, to open up this new season. And Sergio spoke through the Masters victory. He spoke of some of the challenges he's had. You know, he spoke of the ball striking and his approach and what he learned from his dad and stuff. And so all of these guys have different stories to tell. And and, and so I think Phil would be fascinating. I, I think that uh, certainly Jack Nicklaus would be an unreal interview because his book, Golf My Way, is still one of my favorites. And then, you know, I, th- I think uh, Tiger, Rory, and Jordan would be all sorts of fun. I, I think Tiger would be utterly fascinating to, to talk to if he would be open enough of, you know, making the swing changes after the 2000 season and, and not even on the personal stuff, but just his mindset of such a great champion and what he was thinking at that time. I think that'd be the most fascinating 45 minutes you could ever imagine. Hopefully you'll get him on someday. I'll, I'll be listening. <laughs> well, to that, uh, my, my, my interview with Nick Faldo was really eye-opening. Sadly, he was abroad somewhere, and, and, and so the, the, the line quality wasn't so great. But I basically had him walk through some of the crucial shots that he hit in route to his six major championships. And, and getting into his head a little bit was so interesting. And, and to that, you know, learning about the approach, and I asked him about the swing change, and he said, you know, if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have made the swing change when I did, but I would have done it at some stage. So to get these thoughts and to get these insights from these players is so cool. 
And I guess the main thing, if there's like a common denominator for folks, is that, you know, these are all human beings and they all go through their own challenges and, and it certainly isn't as easy as what it appears to us, to, to all of the fans at the outset. Yeah, it would, it would be fascinating, like I said, to sit and, and just be such a brilliant brain, you know, such a brilliant mind of, of golf knowledge and, and everything he's been through. I would love to hear about it. But like I said, all the guys and the guys I've interviewed as well, it's the same thing. If you always pull a couple of really interesting facts from them, and um, I've enjoyed it as well. So I'm with you there. Um, my mm-hmm. next question is how how did you and your brother start playing golf in South Africa? Who introduced you, and um, how did you kind of take to the game? Well, I'm I guess I'll preface the answer by um, admitting <laughs> that I'm about nine years older than Trevor. So um, I at the time was a decent cricketer and a rugby player, and I broke my arm in rugby because we've always been small people, Trevor and I, and I was too small for such a such a man's game and. So as a result, my coach actually said to my parents, look, it's time for Mark to you know, quit the rugby playing. And so I was stuck at home one Saturday morning um, after having the, the, the cast off my arm for the, the operation that I had. And my buddy said to me, hey, we're going to play golf. And so I didn't know how to do that. So I took an old set of clubs from that my dad had in the, uh, the, the garage and we went down to course and I guess the proverbial bug bit. And so... A little while later, my four-year-old brother would sort of tag along because it was easy babysitting for my mom and dad. And so Trevor picked the thing up too. And it was by sheer serendipity, you know, a lot of good fortune. And we met some tremendous people. But it was, you know, just my friends that invited me to go down and play. And I showed a bit of a proficiency for it. I got good pretty quick and came over to college and was successful there. And had a brief stint as a player because I was always more of a teacher and I was always more into how it worked as opposed to the playing thereof. And I guess that was, you know, the genesis for my career now as a broadcast person. So friends' involvement, fell in love with the game instantly. I've been in love with it since. And I'm a passionate golf fan and, and, and I'm just so thankful. I mean, what a great place. What a great country for me to be able to get paid to speak about a game that I love. It's so cool. Was it a tough decision to leave South Africa and come over here to the States to play college golf? Uh, when you made that move to do it? Heck no. Gee whiz. I, I remember at the time I was caddying because I was good, but I didn't think I was good enough to play for a living at that stage. And, and then South Africa had mandatory military training. So I did my, my, my stint in the service. And so I was caddying for a while. And, and I caddied for a young American guy, Tommy Tolls, who now plays in the PGA Tour Champions. And, and he introduced me to a guy called Hugh Royer, who, uh, former PGA Tour player as well, and I caddied for Hugh, and he was like, well, man, what are you doing caddying? You should go to college. And so I said, well, how do I do that? And he said, well, leave this with me. So he called his dad, who was a pro, former winner of the Western Open, and his dad got me into Columbus State University, then Columbus College, and and I got over here. And well, basically, when I got offered the scholarship, I jumped at it. I'd never been over yet on my own, and it was all very new, and there was a lot of adjustment time, but it was a chance of a lifetime, and and it was something that I don't take lightly. And and I and I'm thankful to Hugh and to Tommy and to his dad and all the folks and my coach, Dr. Earl Baggy, for giving me the chance because I got a chance back then that very few young South African people did. I mean, at that stage, the only golfers in college from South Africa were basically myself, Andrew Rice, um, Rory Sabatini, Tim Clark, who were a little bit behind us. And so we were a little bit of the trailblazers, if you will, and, and it was the chance of a lifetime. And obviously in, in college, had to be great experience with two national championships. You were a three-time All-American. Um, and after that was over, you go and turn pro. Which, uh, which tours did you play as a young professional? Did you go play the Sunshine Tour back home, or what was sort of your pathway on, on trying to give that a go? Well, I only played three events. Um, I played State Open in Georgia, and I did pretty well. I think I finished like 10th, and then... I played a couple of events in South Africa, but at that stage, it occurred to me that my designs on being the best golfer in the world were kind of scuppered by my younger brother, so I couldn't beat my household, so beating the rest of the world was going to be hard. So so I, I sort of I saw the writing on the wall, if you will, and, and I was decent enough to sort of be a genuine professional, I guess. Um, but, you know, again, thankfully, I... I, I, I wised up early enough to, to 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 say, well, the golf playing will be up to Trevor, and I'll take care of the rest. 
And then you went back to South Africa to start a teaching center and then taught on the European tour well, as well when you kind of first started professionally teaching? Yeah, that was where I sort of blooded myself as an instructor. For a while over here, I learned from David Ledbetter and Robert Baker, and and so I moved back to South Africa. And then I started teaching kind of on my own and got hired by a few folks, and so I went over to Europe some. And it was like me being on, you know, the mini tours as a player. I was basically working sideline jobs. I remember packing boxes in a warehouse in London to earn enough money to get to the next PGA European Tour event so I could work with my clients. And and so I learned a lot that time, and, and it was an investment that was well served. And, and you know, it, it taught me so much about the craft of being a, a top-flight golf instructor because I had all the knowledge, but there's so many more things that are brought to bear. And so I learned the craft. I learned the travel. I learned how the professional approach to the game works from a playing standpoint. And um, from there, I got offered the job at Columbus State University as the coach, which I couldn't turn down because I knew that America was always the biggest stage for golf, definitely. And so getting back to the United States via Columbus State was, uh, again, a real blessing. And so I took, they offered the job. I took the job and I've been there since now 2001. And and uh, thankfully, the university are very supportive of what we do, and they allow me to do the broadcast stuff as a sideline, and so it's all, it's all good in my world. Who did you work with when you were on the PGA Tour, or the European Tour, I should say? Uh, which professionals that we might know of uh, that you worked with, and which professional that you worked with did you kind of get the most, or you guys did the best work together or got the most out of getting that player to the next level? Well, probably my most success was with my brother, Trevor. Um, he sort of occupied the bulk of my time, and there were a few young South Africans I would work with that were playing over there. Richard Sterney, um, Jean Hugo now plays back in South Africa. Uh, off the top of my head, those are sort of the main ones. There were the odd European tour pros I worked with. Simon Hurd, who incidentally now owns a belt company called Drew Belts. So there were a few guys, sort of like journeyman European tour guys, but the guy that I had the most success with at that time was definitely my brother. Um, he sort of broke through the Challenge Tour and advanced his way through the European Tour. And I've always sort of been a bit of a counsel to Trevor through the years. Um, we've split up and I don't work with him full time. But that was where I learned a lot because being an instructor is one thing, but being you know, a big brother and an instructor is an entirely different one, You know, especially when there's emotions are raw and stuff like that. So... I learned about the mentality of the game too. And so, you know, I'm thankful to have gotten that chance with Trevor because he taught me about the unquantifiables when it comes to communication and understanding people's behavior. And as you're asking them to try and perform whatever or do whatever it is. Well, that's an interesting segue because that was going to be my next question for you was about your brother, Trevor. And my question is, the first one is when he was a young player, at what age did, did, did you as a golfer and everyone around it, you guys start to see the potential of what he could become, of how much talent he had? It was so early. I mean, Trevor, I think, made a hole in one when he was like seven or something like that. You know, he could hit the ball pretty hard because he had to keep up with the big boys. Uh, he learned to play a gritty sort of a game really early and he could score. And he had that funny sort of a thing and you ask him about it now and you'll probably deny the question, but it's like he could almost like a will the ball into the hole at times. And so then I saw there was something special about him. But when I really realized was when I came home from college uh, one day and I had just finished second in the national championship, I think it was, and I was the first team all America. I'd won a couple of times and we went and played golf and he was 13 and I was 22, whatever it was. And we played and he held like a 10 footer in the last hole to beat me straight up. And that's when I was like, okay, <laughs> there's something special on the go here. He had won the World Junior just shortly thereafter, and then we really knew. But he showed it early, and you could see that there was a little something different. And so it was just a matter of time of him figuring out you know, how to play the game for money, and he did. And obviously, the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, he had a really great early start to his career uh, with wins on the European Tour, and then, then comes the 2008 Masters. Uh, I mean, that had to be absolutely incredible for him, for you, your entire family. Uh, you guys must have been so proud. Uh, well, it was surreal. I mean, I still think back to uh, sitting there on the 18th green for the prize giving, watching your younger brother don that green jacket. And 
it was like the perfect Georgia evening. The sun was setting over the pines. You could hear the, the, the train in the distance, not the midnight train, but you could hear the train in the distance. And, and to sit there and think upon the fact that, yeah, someone, your younger brother is one, probably the most coveted title in the game, it was hard to fathom because just a few years prior, we were both watching the tournament on television in South Africa at midnight. So it was it was all just wild, and still thinking back to it, it's kind of hard to 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 really grapple your mind around the thing, you know, to go to his house and see the trophy and to reminisce sometimes about it. I'm not even sure that it's sunk in for him even because it's just such a monumental achievement, and you know, folks have so few like Rory McIlroy. I mean, he'd, he'd give his left arm for a title right now, but you never know. So you know, things have to go one's way, and and you have to obviously play well and the, the, the ball has to take a tumble for you and then you happen to win one of those things and it's a really select fraternity as a member of and, and, and to have watched him done that and have, to have played a really small part in it is especially, especially meaningful. As a former champion, have you got to go there to Augusta National and, and play a round of golf at Augusta with him? And if you did, what was that experience like? Yeah, I did. Uh, the year after, we went back He's current, he's caddy at the time, Neil Wallace and myself and Trevor went up there. We, we arrived on one afternoon, played a round of 18 holes and stayed there the night in the cabins and had nice dinner and just sort of, you know, reminisced. We actually watched the footage of his win on their, uh, the closed circuit television over there and we played golf the next morning. And it was, it was really cool because we sort of walked through places that he was and what was going on and to get, from my point of view, because I was teaching him at the time to get his insights on the shots and to get Neil his K's insights on what was happening and the decisions they made and the things that you ordinarily don't know when you're on the opposite side of the rope was really fun and 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 to obviously drive down Magnolia Lane with the current champion <laughs> that was something special too. How many more wins do you think he had in him if it was not for all these injuries? Because I don't think the general public knows how those injuries really took a, a toll on his career. Yeah, I, you know what, that's hard to say because one never knows. Um, but the way he was playing, the way he was striking the golf ball, I mean, he, he could hit an iron club with the best of them, and he was highly reliable. His golf swing was efficient. Um, so I think he had more wins in him. Was it more majors? I, I could never tell you, but I was certain that the probability was in his favor that he would at least get maybe one or two more victories at minimum. Um, but the injuries, you know, that's just part of life. Uh, and, you know, his were kind of horrific, really, to, from the diaphragm, the tumor in his diaphragm that he had that happened basically in mid tournament, the SA Open, when I was with him. And then, you know, the wrist was a big deal because he played injured with that wrist for a while. And then coming back from that, it's so hard to trust, you know, a lead wrist uh, healing. And so there was always a bit of defense being played there. And 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 that sort of put pay to the career. I think the diaphragm deal was was a big one, but that wrist injury was a biggie, and it, it made him compensate for you know pain and for what he was going through. And then it would refer to his elbow and then his shoulder and farther on, and and it affected the way he certainly approached the game, and more than anything affected the way he swung the golf club. And so, you know, when you're doubtful and you're between two techniques or different approaches, I should say. It's really hard to play the world's best, and, and, and that was sort of the beginning of the challenges for him, I would say. Is, is he trying to make a full-time comeback, or is he, at this point, going to do the broadcasting gig, which, he's, he, by the way, he's excellent at. Um, he's, fantastic. He's, he's great when he's doing on-the-course stuff. I really enjoy listening to him. Or is he going to kind of do the part-time golfing when it, when it makes sense, and then broadcasting is going to be his full-time job at this point? I don't know. You'd have to ask him about that. We've talked about it some. I can tell you this. He's working hard on his game still. And and I can see because he started to play nicely. Um, he played well in Europe here recently. And, and, and I can see a little bit of a twinkle in the eye. So I can't answer that question, but I'm sure he would love to sort of find a little a little form in the game and, and make one last charge because all of his contemporaries, uh, Sergio, Adam Scott, Justin Rose, you know, the guys he played with as he came up, as they all came up through the PGA Tour ranks, they're all young and they're still pretty fit and they're still playing good golf. So I, I know maybe deep down Trevor thinks maybe there's one last run in him. 
How did you get your career started uh, working for the PGA Tour for uh, on-course reporting and the work that you do? How did that come about? <laughs> it was real serendipity. I, I was, you know, decent golf teacher, college golf coach. Um, was driving in a rental car one day and listening to Matt Adams' show, Fairways of Life, and they had some golf instructor on, and I think he called it Teaching Tuesday or whatever. And so I sent Matt a tweet, and I was like, look, if you want a different sounding golf teacher on next Tuesday, give me a call. And so right thereafter, his producer, Dominic, uh, texts me back, and he's like, uh, yeah, I'd love to have you on. So I got on the call with Matt the next week, and I remember it was a wintry day down in Columbus, Georgia, where I live, and obviously Matt was in the Northeast. They were snowbound, and he asked me questions about Trevor and Mr. Player and all of the influences in my life, and and then he said, well, a lot of folks are calling in here. They want to know what can they do in the Northeast, so I gave them a drill that they should try, and then he said the board started lighting up, and folks were calling in, and so one segment turned into three segments, and at the end of it, uh, his producer said, well, that was pretty good. You should consider this stuff, and he put me in touch with a guy called Dave Logue from the PGA Tour. And that was kind of the start of my radio broadcasting career. I'd never done live radio golf before, but I did. And it was all sorts of fun. And that progressed to PGA Tour Live. And that's progressed to CBS Sports. And so it's been a real, it's, it's, I guess it's a story about America because folks come over here and they, you seek their fortune and it's the land of opportunity. And here I am, you know, a golf instructor from a little town in South Africa. He's now broadcasting the biggest tour in the world, the best players in the world, and rubbing shoulders with all these folks. And, you know, if you if you'd asked me this like six, seven years ago, I would have said you were a nutcase. So it's been a cool, it's been a cool run, and I'm just enjoying the ride. Yeah, it's a great story. Um, also, from watching the best players up close, being inside the ropes, is there a, a one or two things that you have learned from being that close to seeing the, the golf and what these guys do and – that maybe maybe has made you even a better instructor. Um, I don't know if it's made me a better instructor because it's things that I knew having worked inside the ropes anyway. But the thing that I that strikes me from watching these guys play more and more is just the resilience of them. You know, the the, the stick to itiveness, the the bounce back that the top golfers have in them, and, and and that's really what separates the folks. They all hit the ball well. They're all reliable. They all make putts when they kind of need to. But everyone's going to have the missteps, and it sort of harkens me back to a lesson I learned from Mr. Player, and he basically said that you know they're going to be up hills, and the big boys deal with it, and the leading players they deal with this stuff, and and being an announcer you get a front row seat, because if you're watching television you basically just see highlights and maybe the final few groups all of the time, where when you're watching these guys play and play shot in shot out day in day out, you can see the grind of it all, and so their resilience there. Their, their moxie really impresses me. Um, let's talk about South African golfers because they, they uh, you know, on top of your brother, there always seem to be a really talented uh, group that kind of makes it out of there. Is there any young and up-and-coming South African golfers that are maybe playing the European tour right now that the American public should be paying attention to that is sort of the next generation coming from that country? Uh, there are a bunch of them. I couldn't pick anyone right now, to be honest. I, I'm, I'm sad that I couldn't. There are a few good ones in college as well. Um, there's a young man who's only else's nephew called Javan Rabula who goes to Oran University who's really good. Um, Garrick Higo is another young man who's at UNLV. So there, there's, there's talent coming through, and on the European tour, there are a bunch of them. And they're all so young. The truth of the matter is, I mean, I'm so busy on the PGA tour, I, I, I don't I don't get to spend the time speaking to these young South Africans that I would like. But then all of a sudden someone shows up and I go and research and, and they're coming through thick and fast. The big thing for the South Africans is just getting to the United States because it's where the big boys play. And Europe, the European tour is an awesome place and all of them get to the PGA tour eventually by way of world rankings. And so, you know, that's how the Charles and the Louis and, and that sort of crowd, Brandon Grace got over here. But I would think in the meantime, the one to watch would be Brandon Grace. You know, he's really sound. He's got a stout mind. He's a real winner. And when he's in contention, he'll close. And so I think Charles and Louis have got their major championship. And I wouldn't be surprised if Gracie gets his here sometime soon. 
Why do you think South Africa produces such great champions? Is it their junior programs very strong when they recognize the talent for not a huge country? Boy, it seems like there's a heck of a lot of good players that come from there. I just think it's the outdoor um, lifestyle over there. It's you know warm summers, the winter time you can still play golf in, in Johannesburg. It's sort of like dormant grass and chilly temperatures and down in the Cape where I'm from, it's just wet and cold. And so you can play golf all year round and in the summertime, you, you, you've got to hit the ball well because the wind blows in the south and it's at elevation in the north. So either way, you must strike the ball well. So they're just athletes that take to golf and, you know, an athletic individual. You've seen in the PGA Tour, like a Dustin Johnson or a Justin Thomas or a Rory or any of these guys, they're all really good athletes. So the South Africans are just athletic, outdoorsy people, and so they take to golf and they, they get pretty good at it. Well, I have a list of some South African golfers, and I'm just going to throw the name out there, and if you can just give me your real quick sort of thoughts or opinions that, that you have about each of these players. So there's no right or wrong answer. Sure. Just sort of give me your thoughts. Ernie Els. Um, Evergreen, legend. Rory Sabatini. Uh, just gritty gutsy. I mean, Rory has, has gotten a lot out of his game, and he's perennial. I mean, the guy just keeps on showing up, and and, and he's, he's a real grinder. Charles Schwartzel. Oh, his, his golf swing for me is so silky. He's, he's uber talented. Just comes from a really good golfing family, and he's got all of the tools. One of my favorites, because he's a character. I don't know if you know him well, but Fulton Allen. <laughs> one of a kind. <laughs> that? So, so that one reputation <laughs> it precedes him. He's he's Uncle Fulty twenty four seven. That is, it's he's a he's character a and a half. Oh, he's a gem. I mean, he's just he was a great player in his day. He just could hit an iron like nobody's business. But but he is uh, he is he's one of a kind. <laughs> Yeah, around with Uncle Fulty, I imagine I would laugh for 18 holes straight. That would be the most entertaining thing ever. Uh, <laughs> Retief Goosen. Silent assassin. He, he's, Goose is so good. I mean, he, he's, to, to think of the major championships that he won, the way he won them, U.S. Opens, um, Goose, you know, if, again, if it wasn't for injury, but very much like Ernie. You know, I said Ernie was evergreen, Goose's as well. Ernie had the knee injury, Goose's had some back issues. If it wasn't for those two things, those guys would still be relevant. <clears throat> Pardon me, relevant. Tim Clark, and I don't know if is he is he retired, but boy, he was good for a lot of years. What's your opinion of him? Oh man, he could drive the ball up a net's rear end. He was so accurate. To me, you could you could set your wristwatch and how well he struck the ball and how accurately he drove it. Um, he's not playing uh, because of the 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 wrist and the forearm issues that he's had. Um, he's actually. Teaching a little golf, I've heard, and Russell Henley, who pops by our place in Columbus to do some work, tells me that he, he checks in and consults with Tim every so often. But, but man, Tim was accurate when he was on. He could absolutely strap it. Louis Oosthuizen. <laughs> uh, just naturally gifted. I, I, I think if there was a case for someone, case to be made for someone who was born with a golf club in their hand, I would say it was Louis. And we've talked about this a little already. Brendan Grace. Grace is all grit. You know, he, 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 I love the way he plays with the flats of the golf ball. Hits it head high if he needs to and can hoist it if he needs to. And he's just a really gutsy sort of a campaigner. And I, I would almost say the prototypical South African. He's got an element of blue chip about him and, uh, pardon me, blue collar about him as well as being blue chip and and, and and that delicate blend between a real grit, a gritty grinder and a, a vastly talented individual, I think, is one of the keys to success. And the last one I have to ask you about is Mr. Player. Um, and do you have a great Mr. Player story? Because there seems to be a bunch of them out there. Uh, trailblazer uh, is what I say. One of the all-time greats. Won the Grand Slam. I mean, I, I don't think people fathom how good Gary Player was. And and, and that's the thing about Mr. Player. The story I've got is, is I mean, the hundreds, but he has a guy who's still jaunting his way around the world 24-7, 365, and, you know, raising money for charity, doing so much for South Africa, doing corporate golf outings for his sponsors, and he still has the energy of a 21-year-old. And, and 
and that in itself is is indicative of who Gary Player is. I mean, the guy is just he he, he walks his talk, and that's cool because. He he was the guy that always said to everyone, you know, you got to live right, you got to be in shape, and you got to keep a good attitude. He is everything that he always said, and and that's the thing that I respect about Mr. Player too. And and if I learned, I've learned many lessons from him, but the big one is that Gary Player is not a respecter of persons or titles. He's like you and the street sweeper and the major champion and the king, you're all the same in my eyes, and he's going to treat you the same way. And and so. He's just a he's a, just a diamond of a human being. Well, if we can look at what's going on in in golf today, and if if you were a golf fan and you were going to go out to a tournament and watch one or two players that let's assume these guys are playing in the field, as a fan, who would you go out and follow, and what do you like about that one or two players that you might bring up here the most about their game, and what would, you know why would you want to go see them play for eighteen holes? Um, obviously my brother. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably still his biggest fan, more than my mom and dad. Um, but if I was a paying fan, I would go and watch Rory McIlroy play the game. He plays the game with still a youthful kind of an exuberance. Um, I, I love his free abandon that he plays with. I just love the golf swing. Um, I love his attitude. I've got to tell you, Rory is one of the quality individuals on the, on the PGA and the World Tours, and, and he, he treats people right. He's a He's a seasoned campaigner, you know, future Hall of Famer, but he's just so so down to earth when you talk with him. And so I'm a huge fan. I, you know, we're not supposed to be fans being in, in, in our industry, but I would pay to go and watch Rory play. Who has technically, if we're just looking at this from a teaching standpoint, one of the two, one or two best golf swings on the PGA Tour, if you were going to point to somebody and say, that's how a golf club should be swung? Um... I would say probably uh, for different reasons, different people, but I would say just, you know, the sweeping answer would be Justin Rose, you know, in terms of how the golf swing's constructed and and, and sequenced and all the rest. He is very sound. But that being said, I think Henrik Stenson, there's so many things that he does, that he does are great. Uh, McElroy, just the free swinging element of his golf swing, I think is to be emulated. So, you know, there, there are various answers to that question but the golf instructor need, needs to say that you know it's measure is how reliable it is and, and does it hit the ball squarely when it means something and so you could say that basically for any one of the world's top players right now we have the masters coming up here next month who is your your pick right now and is there a dark horse that we should be watching out for as well for that tournament that's a really good question um in terms of picks? Yeah, in, in terms of, yeah, top guy, and then maybe somebody who's really trending that, you know, that golf course could set up for that might not be on the tip of everybody's tongue, but you would say, with you being out there, watch for this guy coming April at the Masters. He's playing that well, and he has the talent to do it. Well, I'm going to roll both those questions into one and say Phil Mickelson. I uh, think <laughs> Phil has got another run in him. Um, the way he's playing the mindset that guy is evergreen. I, I would say Phil should be a dark horse because he's, you know, he's a leading contender, but he's not one of the, the, the names at the forefront of things, you know, if you were a betting man. But uh, I think Phil is the guy to keep an eye on. You know, everyone's going to talk about Tiger and the Masters rolling around. And but, but Augusta National asks the same questions and the same sorts of players show up. You've got to be able to hit quality iron shots. Chipping and putting is a big deal around there, but distance control is really important. So you find the same guys contending. Spieth, McElroy, Jason Day, Adam Scott looks like he's moving in the right direction. So you'll probably see someone who owns a green jacket show up. I would just, my storyline for me is I would like to see Sergio Garcia have a really good title defense because I can tell you for free, I was working with Trevor the year that he went back there to defend his title and the pressure of it and showing up there as the chair, the, the, the current master's champion and the guy who's hosting the, the master's club dinner. There's so many demands on one mentally and emotionally. It's a big deal. And for Sergio, I think he will probably have a new baby in the household at that, at that stage. So I'm hoping he plays really well. Um, but anyway, whoever wins, it's well earned because that thing doesn't come for free. 
How do you assess uh, Tiger's comeback so far from the limited rounds or I should say limited tournaments he's played in? Uh, do you like what you're seeing? Do you like the trend line? What's sort of your thoughts on, on what he's doing, where he sort of seems to be going? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm surprised, um, given where he was, because I called him a Tory Pines that was sort of scrappy, but he, he gamed it out. And that, for me, is the measure of a good player, is the ability to make a good score despite not having your best stuff. And he did that at Torrey Pines. And then um, LA, the Genesis Open, was kind of messy and the ball striking was all over the show. And then to go from that to the Honda Classic was, and the way he played there was uh, eye-opening and kind of mind-numbing for me how he managed to do that in such a short space of time around a course that didn't really suit him. And then uh, at the Valspar this week, things are going in the right direction again. So <laughs> the trend appears good. He appears healthy. I mean, he's all sorts of speed got going on there. I just want to see him continue to hit shots, you know, and not just go for the full-blooded drive all the time because when, for me, with Tiger's at his best when he flights the golf ball well. And, and so if he continues to do that, <laughs> who knows what might happen in, in the weeks and months to come. Yeah, I, I agree with you on – I've played that golf course at PJ National. That I mean, the way he was sitting at the week before, then to see him come out there where – you got to keep the ball in play, and it's a hard golf course. And watching him kind of hit more three woods and stingers and more kind of on top of it, I, I really thought that was a huge directional turn for him to off a tough week to go into that golf course, which always plays tough, and to play really good, solid golf. It, I was surprised to see it as well. I think most people in golf were, but looks like he's getting there. Well, he's got he's, he's, he's got the swagger back certainly, and he's got there, there are a few more smiles going on, which is always an indicator because. Like my mom always said to me, your tongue and your mouth are the indicator of what's going on inside. And Tiger's smiling more often. You know, he's hitting decent shots. Looks like he's having fun with it. And 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 for me, it's people need to know that professional golf is a grind. You know, the average fan thinks it's all sunshine and lollipops and private jets and big houses and fancy cars. And it is, you know, if you do well, but. It's a real grind, and if it's not going well, it's not a fun deal. And Tiger looks like he's having all sorts of fun with this current comeback. And another uh, hot topic that's been out there this you know, last week or so is the thought on rolling the golf ball back and the distance that some of the, or most all the professional PGA Tour players are hitting the ball. What's your sort of thought on that or your take of it and does there need to be two sets of rules because, you know, myself swinging at 100 miles an hour, I'm not overpowering anything, or does it need to be one set of rules under golf and they're just going to have to play some of these things at 7,500 yards or 7,600 yards and, you know, the, the elite players are going to keep getting longer and longer and that's just the way it's going to be going. What's sort of your thoughts on how would you fix it or do you just let it go the way it's sort of progressing now? Well, I think it's past the point of no return, personally. I don't think you can just suddenly come with some sweeping legislation and roll the ball back. Because the truth of it is, these guys are bigger and stronger and faster than what they used to be. And rolling the ball back, I don't think it's going to make that big a difference. Because Dustin might not hit it 340, but he'll hit 300 then. And then he'll still have an advantage. So whether you shorten everyone up, I can't see the change. Um, I, I, I think the way you control it, if you want to, I mean, look at Valspar at Innisbrook this week. The golf course is, what, a smidgen over 7,300. And the low round was four and a par after day one. So you get some firm greens, you get a little bit of rough, but now that's going to slow down play. So that opens up a different can of worms. But, you know, if someone wants to somehow control this thing, you can do it with a golf course. You don't have to build 9,000-yard golf courses because the golf club companies will respond and the athletes will get bigger and stronger and faster. So... Human beings are great adapters, I believe. You know, we 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 built to adapt. So courses get longer, golfers will hit it farther. I I see junior golfers now and they hit it a ton. College kids hit it a mile. I mean, they're longer than a lot of PGA tour guys because that's how they've learned the game. So if you change the setup of golf courses, the approach to it will change. So I, I don't really have an opinion, but I do believe that we we pass the point of no re return with a golf ball. Who's had the most raw talent that you've ever worked with or, or seen or, or played golf with or basically have been around? Of all the PGA Tour players you've gotten to see and know, who impressed you the most with just their amount of talent? Well, that I've worked with would be only else. I mean, <laughs> the, the man is so talented, so much touch, you know, just a 
I mean, like I said, Louis West Desmond was gifted. Ernie Els had a special gift as well. Now, all of them, anyone who's played on the PGA Tour, they are uber talented. And I oftentimes say to folks, you know, it's like the NFL. You've got to really, you've got to be really good to suck in the NFL. And it's the same thing on the PGA Tour. So every single one of the guys out there is really sound. Um, but they are the special ones. Um, but of the folks I've gotten to spend extended periods of time around, Els is special. You don't win multiple major championships and assemble a career that he did if you weren't. Um, Phil is obviously, I've never worked with him, but just watching him, there's supreme talent there. He's got hands on like any other. Tiger's the same sort of thing. But again, these are all Hall of Famers and you don't get, they don't let you into the Hall of Fame. You earn your way in there. And so I would say the folks I've gotten close to, I'd say Ernie was the best. Well, I have two questions to go. Um, the last one's are or I kind of ask this one to everyone who's on the on the podcast, but what's your three favorite golf courses in the world and what makes those golf courses so great? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Augusta National for obvious reasons. I love um, the old course, although I've never got to play it. I just love the history of it. Well, well okay, here's the open disclosure. Anything that's got Bob Jones involved with it, and I'm a big fan. So Augusta National, the old course, and then probably Peachtree in Atlanta, uh, Peachtree Golf Club. Uh, there, there's so many, so it's a tough question. But if I had to have a, a course I'd play for the rest of my life, it would be Peachtree. Oh, and Shinnecock Hills. I just love the whole feel of Shinnecock, and, and, and it's got a blend of up and down and seaside and some links and some inland. So, so many good ones. So I, that, that's a difficult question. Our, our last question, I'm going to have you put your instructor hat on. So for a lot of us in the Midwest and, and out East, spring is coming around. So as a teacher, what uh, what couple tips or instructional tips would you have for us kind of coming out of the, the cold season and getting ready for spring? What should we do to try to improve our game or kind of get our groove back a little bit? The first thing I would do is just start stretching, you know, start preparing your body for the onslaught to use a little Midwest parlance, you know, Lots of agricultural people out there, they till their land before they plant the seed. And so in the springtime, yet it's a season of growth. So you must make sure that your body is ready for whatever you are going to ask it to do. Because if you are sort of tight physically and then you're trying to make a certain style move, it's unlikely that you'll do it consistently. So get yourself loosened up, get yourself limber first, you know, make sure that the body is operational. And then I would just really focus on where the base of the golf swing is and it's easy to do you take a tee you stick it in the ground so it's just uh, just a smidgen above the turf just the nib of the tee needs to show address it like it's your golf ball make your swing clip that tee if it's a wooden tee it might leave a mark under the club so you can see where the the tee is interacting with the golf club and if you can hit that thing consistently and if you can bottom out your swing consistently you are likely to hit the ball flush if you get the ball flush, it's going to make its cover. And even though it's a little right or left, you should be okay. So I would say start to access the base of your swing, become aware of your club, but most importantly, ensure that your body is ready for action. Well, Mark, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I know you're extremely busy, but this has been, I think, a fascinating conversation. So thank you for being on the podcast, and I really appreciate your time. That's my pleasure. I appreciate all your guys' support, and thank you for following us. That's really cool.